This month, we are moving on to Nintendo Power 54 for November of 1993. We have another featured Ant Super Nintendo RPG with Secret of Mana. Our cover game this issue, as mentioned in the intro, is Secret of Mana, featuring a Dragon Pegasus thing. In the letters column, we have a whole bunch of letters about Star Fox, but the more notable bit here is we have the winners of the readers submitted Robot Master Contest for the next Mega Man game. Nightman and Windman. Our first game of the issue is our cover game, Secret of Mana, with a rundown of the interface, attacks, and general mechanics, along with a general order of locations and more detailed maps of some of those locations. As a JRPG, Secret of Mana plays incredibly well. In combat, the controls are smooth, and it's pretty straightforward to get your shots in on enemies, with the strength mechanic working nicely lets you decide if you want to go with a bunch of slower, stronger hits, or a bunch of faster but weaker hits. However, from an interface standpoint, the game is rough. It unlocks portions of your interface, like access to healing items or the ability to equip your weapons and armor, kind of slowly. This is a shame, because it makes the game a little more rough to handle than I'd like. I can understand slowly easing in your mechanics, but there's got to be a better way than this. This doesn't say the game is bad. Far from it. This is one of the best action RPGs, and for that matter, JRPGs, on the Super Nintendo. However, there have been some refinements to this type of game since this came out, and there are quality of life improvements that later games have, games have had that will not be there when you come into this game, so you have to keep that under consideration and keep an open mind. That said, with Secret of Mana giving an upcoming remake on modern consoles, the gameplay issues may be fixed with that version of the game, so if this version doesn't work for you, I'd recommend checking out the remake when it comes out. We have another seasonal sports rundown with notes on several games. I want to pick one game per sport, and I want to skip over the EA titles just for the interest of time and to cover some of the alternatives to the more well-known franchises that persist to this day. First, we have World Soccer 94. This game plays super fast. The game, by default, uses a one-minute play clock per half, but makes up for it with super sped-up character animations, and the weird thing is it works. The controls are fine, even with this incredible high speed, and the passing and fielding works well, with the penalties being handled right, and the AI balance leading to scores that are comparable to an actual game of soccer. This takes a full game of soccer, which can take an hour to half an hour, boils it, an oh, okay, hour and a half, or do, I believe, actually believe it was normal one time, I think, boils it down to two minutes and makes it work. The only thing that makes it unsatisfying is the short periods make you want more. It's like eating a single Oreo cookie. Tastes good, an enjoyable experience, but you're going to want to grab another one after eating the first one. By comparison, Dig and Spike Volleyball is a much more deliberately paced game. It doesn't go quite as fast, it's kind of slow, it does a bunch of really interesting things in terms of design, though. For starters, the game has a straight-up tutorial for each of the different types of shots you can do in the game, not just showing you the button inputs and what it's supposed to look like, but having you do it and, and try to do it until you do it successfully. Though the tutorials don't cover the kind of serves, which is something of a bummer. Other than that, once you get the hang of the controls, Dig and Spike Volleyball makes for a really interesting volleyball game, though actually game, actual games feel like they run as long as an actual professional or Olympic volleyball game, so a single game could take a whole session, and going through the career mode could take several days. Next we have International Tennis Tour, and this is not a great tennis game. Point. I've thought about it a bunch, and the problem at a fundamental level comes from the camera angle. A lot of the best tennis games, from NES Tennis to Top Spin, have a more elevated camera and a zoomed out camera angle, which gives the player a better perspective over where they are, in comparison to the ball on the court, and in turn where their opponent is so they can better target their shots. This game does not have that. Making, playing the game, getting the shots in to 
score points and Point. to respond to your opponent's shots, tricky to do. Further, the game really needs to simplify how it handles serving, so it's easier to pull off a serve without faulting in terms of future games in this series, if we get any. Tecmo Super Bowl is one of the best Super Nintendo football games I've played thus far. The passing mechanics are great and running generally works well, though it doesn't have any real sort of dash functionality that you can use when you're trying to break free from coverage. You have a just break free button that you can mash if someone tries to tackle you, but it never seems to actually work. My main complaint with Tecmo Super Bowl is with the season mode. You have to simulate every game that you're not playing one at a time instead of just skipping to your team's games. Ready. Top Gear 2 is not as good as its predecessor as far as racing games go. As a player, I have no feedback on what I need to be doing to win a race. I can get general feedback on what I need to do to get a clean lap, but I don't know how far ahead the next racer is and how far behind I am in terms of qualifying to win. This is aggregated by the fact that even on the lowest difficulties, AI tends to run a spotless race. In one race on the first track, on amateur difficulty, I was on the brink of being lapped by the first place AI, and aside from them possibly having a higher qualifying position, I don't know what they did to do so well, and what I could do to catch up. F1 Race of Champions 2 tries to give the game an F-Zero style of performance and graphical style, and it doesn't quite work. The problem is this. In F-Zero, you only really have so many racers on the track that you are actually competing against, and so you can never really drop out of the top 10 or the top 8. You still have to be in first place to win, but you have less racers to try and get past in order to reach that point. In F1 Race of Champions 2, on the other hand, you're going up against a full field of 25, with the bumper cars, collision physics from F-Zero, and that, combined with a very spotty AI, makes for a racer that is not very fun to play. Next is Sim Ant, which is another of the Sim games, and one which I was never really able to get the hang of on PC. Sim Ant is kind of weird. It is, in a way, much closer to what we would consider to be a real-time strategy game, with the catch be that this was made in the early days of the real-time strategy genre, when a whole bunch of people since then have made a whole bunch of mistakes to move the genre along. This game is a game which makes a bunch of those mistakes which people have since then learned from. Part of this is due to issues with the interface and how well it works or doesn't work with the controller, and part of this is, how is due to how the game handles combat. By having a swarm of friendly ants following your hero character around the ramp, the map, and then when you attack an enemy, you have to manage your hero's position in relation to the enemy ants so your minions can handle the fighting. It's a very flawed game, in the kind of ways that I wish this game had received a remake in the same way that we received remakes of Sid Meier's Pirates and of Railroad Tycoon. I think a modern game designer could take everything that people have learned in the past 20 years of real-time strategy game design and make something that really works both on the PC and consoles. However, Maxis doesn't really exist in the same way anymore, so basically someone would have to make the Cities XL of Ant Colony simulation games. Next we have Arrow the Acrobat, which is Sunsoft's turn at making a mascot platformer with maps of much of the game. Arrow the Acrobat, as a platformer, is almost just right. The controls take a bit of learning, but once you figure out how the attack works, things go pretty well. The levels are designed with some very real thought, requiring some exploration to find the things you need to progress. However, the physics are off. In particular, your momentum on platforms is just slippery enough that it's way too easy to slide off platforms, platforms to your death, particularly in levels requiring fun maneuvering, which I would count the first level in that number. This makes the game very obnoxious to play, and will definitely wear on players as the game goes on. In Nestor's Adventures, we have a tip for fighting Wampas in Super Empire Strikes Back. 
Next up is the Super Nintendo version of Jurassic Park, which appears to be a hybrid between a top-down action game and a first-person shooter. We have an overworld map and several dungeon maps. Jurassic Park on the Super Nintendo is a game with a rather high degree of difficulty. The game switches between a top-down perspective in the overworld and a first-person shooter when exploring buildings. Now, the top-down perspective is the same perspective that we got from the NES and Game Boy versions. But unlike the other two time titles, the overworld is considerably more claustrophobic and enemies are much more unforgiving. Three hits from a raptor will kill you outright, and the time to recover from being stunned after getting hit is more than enough time for the enemy to line up another attack, which means if a raptor gets a drop on you, you are dead and have to start over from the last checkpoint. Considering how deadly raptors actually are, this is certainly accurate to critters, but it's not fun from a gameplay standpoint. This isn't helped by the size of the sprites. Copies are smaller than the sprite of your character, which is fine, but raptors are considerably larger making it impossible for you to navigate around them. And it's also inaccurate to the critters, which are generally man-sized, maybe a little smaller. It makes for a game that is frustrating and tedious, and definitely not worth your time. We next have the sequel to Act Razor, Act Razor 2, which is missing the simulation elements from the first game and instead focuses on the action scenes. The article is maps of the first seven stages. Act Razor 2 is okay. The platforming itself is alright, though some of the combat is iffy. There's some slowdown when you get a bunch of enemies on screen at a time, and the game's first boss deals a ton of damage with their hits. It's fine enough, and I do appreciate that the game replaces the lack of the simulation mode with a degree of non-linearity by letting you choose what monster lair to take on first. But it's just rough enough that I'm not entirely on board with it. In classified information, there's info on shoplifting in Link's Awakening. In the Star Fox comic, an anthropomorphic Mario, uh, animal version of Mario is making a statue of the Star Fox team. Meanwhile, Andros, along with his clone, is preparing another attack. Moving on to Game Boy games, we have Ultima Runes of Virtue 2, a sequel to the earlier puzzle adventure game. So, Runes of Virtue 2 is less puzzly and instead closer to Gauntlet with the player exploring dungeons in order to rescue the mayors of various cities in Verdania in order to defeat the Black Knight. Now, the game itself is okay, though the controls have a few issues. Specifically, you can only move an attack in the cardinal directions, up, down, left, right, while enemies have no such limitations, and indeed some can move through walls, so the enemies would be much more manageable if you could attack on the diagonal, so it makes for something of a frustrating experience. Next up is Kirby's Pinball Land. The premise is fairly self-explanatory, and the game has three tables, with the article giving maps of all three. So, the game boards in the game have effectively the same structure. The board is divided up into three parts. There's a bottom part with the center enemy, who, if you hit them enough times, will allow you to propel Kirby to an upper part. And there's a middle portion with a specific board mechanic that will push you up one further slot once you figure it out and finally a top board where, theoretically, you can win the board. I say theoretically, as while I enjoy pinball games, I'm not exactly great at pinball, and this game is no exception. I did enjoy this game a lot, but I wasn't able to master each table. As an additional annoyance, the leaderboards are combined for all three tables as opposed to separate leaderboards for each one, which further emphasizes the issues of the similarities between the three. I'd certainly say the game is worth picking up, but know that there's going to be a degree of monotony. We have Gearworks Next, a puzzle game based around matching a series of gears to work a mechanism. Gearworks is an interesting game, but it has a problem. The puzzles use a randomly generated sequence of gears, with points being penalized for any wasted gears, and only certain gears working together, and you should be able to see the problem from here. Getting a bunch of trash gears can cost you considerable amounts of time and points. So, there's that. So, it's not a case of, optimi of knowing the optimal placement for the gears that you get in terms of um, using your set gear sequence. It's more just shuffling gears until the random number generator gives you the gears you want and need to complete 
to the level, and hoping you don't get gear screwed. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips for Dungeon Master on the Super Nintendo. Our feature article this issue is on Project Reality. That's right, with the ultimate failure of the Philips CD project, even at this point, Nintendo has started taking steps towards the Nintendo 64, starting their partnership for, with Silicon Graphics for what is outright said to be the next Nintendo console. In terms of the Nintendo timeline, this is notable because at this point, we are still talking about NES games in Nintendo Power. Normally, you don't do this kind of thing in the tech sector. Like, if you've watched LGR's Tech Tales, this is the kind of thing that killed Osborne and Commodore. Having your sales and marketing people hyping the next generation of product when there is no product to sell. All the Project Reality photos we have here are tech demos made on SGI workstations, as in the kind of thing Pixar is using around this time working on what would become Toy Story. Moving into NES games, we have the Super, we have the NES version of TMNT Tournament Fighters, featuring all four turtles, of course. Casey Jones, Shredder, and Hothead, who only appeared in one issue of the Archie comic. TMNT Tournament Fighters plays, Tournament Fighters plays okay for a NES fighting game. The controls are responsive and the moves work okay. The game does have a few little issues. There is no chip damage when blocking, so you have no disincentive against turtling. No pun intended. The game also has an interesting way of handling super moves. Partway through the match, I have noticed on average this happens when one character or both has been reduced to half health, Splinter will send a drone to drop a ball near where the fighters are. If you or your opponent can pick up the ball by pressing down B, that character can do a super move. However, if you miss the move, you literally drop the ball, and your opponent can pick it up and try to do a super move instead. It really changes the ebb and flow of the match. It's an artificial construct, but it's one that's called out as such within the game, which works in its favor. Our final game, or rather games this issue, are NES ports of Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man, which are released on different carts, so the article gives the impression that it's a combo cart. So, I'm going to cover these all in one whack, because they are both excellent arcade ports, both spot-on, of games which play similarly, they have their differences, but are very similar, are very similar games otherwise, and which are pretty much, again, spot-on. The logic for the ghost of the game feels right, the controls feel right, and the sounds are great. This isn't particularly surprising, considering the NES, from a processing standpoint, is more powerful than the original hard arcade hardware for these games. Theoretically, you probably could put both of these on a multi-cart, sort of like what was done with Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt, but instead, since they're just repackaging the Famicom version for the US market, this works. Works just fine, no added chip needed. Um, it's more the fact that these are coming out in the U.S. so late in the console's life cycle. These would probably be not that expensive to find on the NES, or, or find a, um, NES release of. As it is, a Famicom release is probably going to be dirt cheap if you have a way to play Famicom games. In the top 20, Super Street Fighter, or Street Fighter 2 Turbo, it's not super yet, has taken the top spot on the Super Nintendo, Kirby's Adventure has the number one spot on the NES, and Mario Land 2 is still ruling the roost on the Game Boy. In Now Playing, Renovation has two RPGs on the way for the Super Nintendo, with The Journey Home and Arcus Odyssey, while Taito has Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. In Pack Watch, Absolute has the sequel to Super Battle Tank, with Super Battle Tank 2, Turn and Burn. For my pick of the issue, I am, no surprise here, going with Secret of Mana, if you can find a copy. It's a great action RPG, but it's also costly to get a hold of. Honestly, I consider this both my multiplayer and single player pick. If you can't get a hold of Secret of Mana, um, honestly, for another game, the soccer game that we got this issue, World Soccer 94, if you can find a copy, um, also, really good. I really appreciate the fact that it is a soccer console game 
that it moves incredibly fast and has an incredibly brisk pace to it. That's something that's really appreciated for any sports game. It lets you... It it's, moves at a brisk enough of a pace that you could probably play through a season really quick. Like, in a, in a day or two. And it also makes for a really good sort of sit down and play a sports game with a bunch of friends type of game. Because of how fast the game moves, you can trade off between friends and give people who are watching a chance to play the game without ha them having to sit around and wait for a while. Next month, we're going to have a fighting game with a different kind of digitized characters. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.